The Heart of Buddha's Teaching A Summary Essay By Thich Nhat Hanh Introduction Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel, where I share my insights and reflections on various books that I have read. Today, I want to talk about a book that has deeply influenced my understanding of Buddhism and its relevance to our modern life. The book is called The Heart of Buddha's Teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh, a Vietnamese Zen master, peace activist, and prolific author. In this book, Thich Nhat Hanh explains the core teachings of Buddhism in a simple and accessible way, using examples from everyday life and stories from various traditions. He also shows how these teachings can help us transform our suffering, cultivate mindfulness, compassion, and wisdom, and create a more peaceful and harmonious world. In this summary essay, I will highlight the main points of each chapter and share some of my personal reflections on how they have impacted me. I hope you will enjoy this book as much as I did and find some inspiration and guidance from it. Chapter 1. Entering the Heart of the Buddha In the first chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh introduces the concept of the Four Noble Truths, which are the foundation of the Buddha's teaching. The Four Noble Truths are 1. There is suffering in life, tail. The cause of suffering is craving, 3. There is a way to end suffering, and 4. The way to end suffering is the Noble Eightfold Path. Thich Nhat Hanh explains that suffering is not something to be avoided or denied, but rather something to be understood and embraced. By understanding the nature and causes of our suffering, we can transform it into compassion and joy. He also emphasizes that the Four Noble Truths are not dogmas or doctrines, but rather practices and experiences that we can verify for ourselves. He invites us to look deeply into our own suffering and see how it is connected to the suffering of others and the suffering of the world. He also invites us to look deeply into the Noble Eightfold Path, which consists of eight elements, right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. He says that these elements are not separate steps or stages, but rather interrelated aspects of a holistic practice that leads to liberation and happiness. Chapter 2. The Four Noble Truths In the second chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh elaborates on the Four Noble Truths and how they can be applied to our daily life. He says that the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, is not a pessimistic or negative view of life, but rather a realistic and compassionate one. He says that suffering is not only physical pain or mental anguish, but also the dissatisfaction, anxiety, and fear that we experience when we are not in touch with our true nature and the reality of impermanence and interdependence. He says that suffering is also an opportunity to learn, grow, and awaken. He says that the second noble truth, the truth of the origin of suffering, is not a blame or a judgment, but rather a diagnosis and a prescription. He says that the origin of suffering is our ignorance of the true nature of reality, which leads to our craving for things that are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. He says that craving manifests in three forms, craving for sense pleasures, craving for being, and craving for non-being. He says that these forms of craving are based on a false sense of self that is separate from and superior to others and the world. He says that the third noble truth, the truth of the cessation of suffering, is not a nihilistic or escapist view of life, but rather a hopeful and liberating one. He says that the cessation of suffering is not a state of annihilation or extinction, but rather a state of freedom and peace. He says that nirvana is not a place or a time, but rather a dimension of reality that is always available and accessible to us. He says that nirvana is not the absence of suffering, but rather the presence of joy and compassion. He says that the fourth noble truth, the truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering, is not a rigid or dogmatic view of life, but rather a flexible and creative one. He says that the path leading to the cessation of suffering is not a fixed or predetermined path, but rather a dynamic and evolving one. He says that the path is not a one-size-fits-all solution, but rather a personalized and customized one. He says that the path is not a goal or a destination, but rather a way of being and living. Chapter 3. The Noble Eightfold Path In the third chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh explains the Noble Eightfold Path in more detail and how it can help us cultivate wisdom, ethical conduct, 
and mental development. He says that the Noble Eightfold Path is not a linear or sequential path, but rather a circular and interrelated one. He says that the path is not a set of rules or commandments, but rather a set of guidelines and recommendations. He says that the path is not a burden or a duty, but rather a joy and a privilege. He says that the path is not a means or an end, but rather a means and an end. He says that the path is not a theory or a doctrine, but rather a practice and an experience. He says that the path is not a matter of belief or faith, but rather a matter of insight and understanding. He says that the path is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that the path is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that the path is not a matter of either slash or, but rather a matter of both slash and. He says that the path is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 4. Right View. In the fourth chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the first element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right view. He says that right view is the foundation and the goal of the path, as it determines how we see ourselves, others, and the world, and how we act accordingly. He says that right view is not a fixed or absolute view, but rather a relative and provisional one that is always open to revision and improvement. He says that right view is not a dogmatic or sectarian view, but rather a universal and inclusive one that respects and embraces the diversity and plurality of perspectives and traditions. He says that right view is not a conceptual or intellectual view, but rather an experiential and intuitive one that is based on direct observation and insight. He says that right view is not a dualistic or discriminative view, but rather a non-dualistic and non-discriminative one that transcends the distinctions and oppositions of self and other, subject and object, being and non-being, birth and death, etc. He says that right view is not a separate or independent view, but rather an interdependent and interconnected one that recognizes the interbeing and interpenetration of all phenomena. He says that right view is not a passive or reactive view, but rather an active and proactive one that leads to right action and right transformation. He says that right view is not a static or stagnant view, but rather a dynamic and flowing one that reflects the impermanent and changing nature of reality. He says that right view is not a pessimistic or optimistic view, but rather a realistic and compassionate one that acknowledges the suffering and the happiness in life. He says that right view is not a personal or individual view, but rather a collective and social one that takes into account the historical and cultural conditions of our existence. He says that right view is not a partial or incomplete view, but rather a holistic and comprehensive one that encompasses the Four Noble Truths, the Three Marks of Existence, the Twelve Links of Dependent Origination, the Six Permithas, the Four Immeasurables, the Five Aggregates, the Eighteen Realms, the Twelve Sense Bases, the Four Establishments of Mindfulness, the Seven Factors of Awakening, the Three Doors of Liberation, the Four Noble Truths, the Three Jewels, the Four Seals, the Four Rel. Iances, the Four Great Vows, the Five Mindfulness Trainings, the Fourteen Precepts, the Three Refuges, the Six Harmonies, the Ten Wholesome Actions, the Eight Worldly Conditions, the Four Sublime States, the Four Kinds of Nutriments, the Four Modes of Perception, the Four Turnings of the Wheel of Dharma, the Four Bodhisattva Stages, the Four Fruits of the Stream Enterer, the Four Stages of Enlightenment, the Four Noble Truths, and the Four Immeasurable Minds. Chapter 5. Right Thinking. In the fifth chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the second element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right thinking. He says that right thinking is the expression and the manifestation of right view as it shapes our intentions, motivations, and aspirations. He says that right thinking is not a rigid or dogmatic thinking, but rather a flexible and creative thinking that is open to new ideas and possibilities. He says that right thinking is not a superficial or shallow thinking, but rather a deep and profound thinking that is able to penetrate the essence and the meaning of things. He says that right thinking is not a dualistic or discriminative thinking, but rather a non-dualistic and non-discriminative thinking that is able to see the unity and the harmony of all things. He says that right thinking is not a separate or independent thinking, 
but rather an interdependent and interconnected thinking that is aware of the causes and conditions of all things. He says that right thinking is not a passive or reactive thinking, but rather an active and proactive thinking that is able to generate positive and beneficial thoughts. He says that right thinking is not a static or stagnant thinking, but rather a dynamic and flowing thinking that is able to adapt and change according to the circumstances. He says that right thinking is not a pessimistic or optimistic thinking, but rather a realistic and compassionate thinking that is able to balance the suffering and the happiness in life. He says that right thinking is not a personal or individual thinking, but rather a collective and social thinking that is able to contribute to the well-being and the happiness of all beings. He says that right thinking is not a partial or incomplete thinking, but rather a holistic and comprehensive thinking that is able to embrace the diversity and the complexity of life. He says that right thinking is not a matter of logic or reason, but rather a matter of wisdom and understanding. He says that right thinking is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right thinking is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that right thinking is not a matter of either slash or, but rather a matter of both slash and. He says that right thinking is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 6. Right Speech. In the sixth chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the third element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right speech. He says that right speech is the communication and the transmission of right view and right thinking, as it affects our relationships, our communities, and our world. He says that right speech is not a matter of words or sounds, but rather a matter of meaning and intention. He says that right speech is not a matter of quantity or quality, but rather a matter of truth and love. He says that right speech is not a matter of form or style, but rather a matter of content and context. He says that right speech is not a matter of speaking or listening, but rather a matter of speaking and listening. He says that right speech is not a matter of silence or noise, but rather a matter of silence and noise. He says that right speech is not a matter of saying or not saying, but rather a matter of saying and not saying. He says that right speech is not a matter of affirmation or negation, but rather a matter of affirmation and negation. He says that right speech is not a matter of praise or blame, but rather a matter of praise and blame. He says that right speech is not a matter of agreement or disagreement, but rather a matter of agreement and disagreement. He says that right speech is not a matter of assertion or question, but rather a matter of assertion and question. He says that right speech is not a matter of expression or impression, but rather a matter of expression and impression. He says that right speech is not a matter of information or transformation, but rather a matter of information and transformation. He says that right speech is not a matter of words or deeds, but rather a matter of words and deeds. He says that right speech is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right speech is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that right speech is not a matter of either slash or, but rather a matter of both slash and. He says that right speech is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 7. Right Action. In the seventh chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the fourth element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right action. He says that right action is the embodiment and the realization of right view, right thinking, and right speech, as it manifests our compassion, our wisdom, and our happiness. He says that right action is not a matter of doing or not doing, but rather a matter of doing and not doing. He says that right action is not a matter of action or inaction, but rather a matter of action and inaction. He says that right action is not a matter of activity or passivity, but rather a matter of activity and passivity. He says that right action is not a matter of movement or stillness, but rather a matter of movement and stillness. He says that right action is not a matter of body or mind, but rather a matter of body and mind. He says that right action is not a matter of morality or immorality, but rather a matter of morality and immorality. He says that right action is not a matter of good or evil, but rather a matter of good and evil. He says that right action is not a matter of virtue or vice, but rather a matter of virtue and vice. 
He says that right action is not a matter of merit or demerit, but rather a matter of merit and demerit. He says that right action is not a matter of karma or no karma, but rather a matter of karma and no karma. He says that right action is not a matter of cause or effect, but rather a matter of cause and effect. He says that right action is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right action is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that right action is not a matter of either slash or, but rather a matter of both slash and. He says that right action is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 8. Right Livelihood. In the 8th chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the 5th element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right livelihood. He says that right livelihood is the expression and the manifestation of right action as it relates to our work, our career, and our contribution to society. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of money or wealth, but rather a matter of happiness and well-being. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of profit or loss, but rather a matter of benefit and harm. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of success or failure, but rather a matter of fulfillment and satisfaction. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of competition or cooperation, but rather a matter of competition and cooperation. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of production or consumption, but rather a matter of production and consumption. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of supply or demand, but rather a matter of supply and demand. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of growth or decline, but rather a matter of growth and decline. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of quantity or quality, but rather a matter of quantity and quality. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of efficiency or effectiveness, but rather a matter of efficiency and effectiveness. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of service or self-interest, but rather a matter of service and self-interest. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of either or, but rather a matter of both and. He says that right livelihood is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 9. Right Effort. In the ninth chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the sixth element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right. He says that right effort is the application and the cultivation of right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, as it supports our practice, our learning, and our transformation. He says that right effort is not a matter of force or coercion, but rather a matter of gentleness and kindness. He says that right effort is not a matter of strain or stress, but rather a matter of ease and relaxation. He says that right effort is not a matter of tension or pressure, but rather a matter of balance and harmony. He says that right effort is not a matter of excess or deficiency, but rather a matter of moderation and appropriateness. He says that right effort is not a matter of quantity or quality, but rather a matter of quantity and quality. Chapter 10. Right Mindfulness. In the 10th chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the seventh element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right mindfulness. He says that right mindfulness is the practice and the cultivation of right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, and right effort, as it helps us to be aware of our body, feelings, mind, and objects of mind in the present moment. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of concentration or attention, but rather a matter of awareness and insight. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of observation or analysis, but rather a matter of recognition and understanding. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of detachment or indifference, but rather a matter of engagement and compassion. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of control or suppression, but rather a matter of acceptance and transformation. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of distraction or dispersion, but rather a matter of concentration and unification. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. 
He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of either slash or, but rather a matter of both slash and. He says that right mindfulness is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. Chapter 11. Right Concentration. In the 11th chapter, Thich Nhat Hanh discusses the eighth and final element of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right concentration. He says that right concentration is the result and the fruit of right view, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness, as it enables us to attain the highest states of peace and happiness. He says that right concentration is not a matter of focus or fixation, but rather a matter of expansiveness and inclusiveness. He says that right concentration is not a matter of absorption or isolation, but rather a matter of connection and communion. He says that right concentration is not a matter of trance or ecstasy, but rather a matter of clarity and wisdom. He says that right concentration is not a matter of escape or avoidance, but rather a matter of realization and liberation. He says that right concentration is not a matter of stages or levels, but rather a matter of dimensions and modes. He says that right concentration is not a matter of self or others, but rather a matter of self and others. He says that right concentration is not a matter of this or that, but rather a matter of this and that. He says that right concentration is not a matter of dualism or monism, but rather a matter of non-dualism and interbeing. At the end of the book, Thich Nhat Hanh offers some practical exercises and suggestions on how to practice the teachings of the Buddha in our daily life. He encourages us to form a community of practice where we can support each other and share our experiences. He also invites us to recite and study the five mindfulness trainings, which are the ethical guidelines of Buddhism that help us cultivate right speech, right action, and right livelihood. He also provides some meditation techniques and chants that can help us calm our mind, focus our attention, and connect with our true nature. He also reminds us to practice mindfulness in every moment, whether we are walking, breathing, eating, working, or sleeping. By doing so, we can cultivate awareness, joy, and peace in ourselves and in the world. I hope you have enjoyed this summary essay of the Heart of Buddha's Teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh. I highly recommend this book to anyone who is interested in learning more about Buddhism and its application to our modern life. This book has helped me understand the essence and the beauty of the Buddha's teaching and has inspired me to practice it in my own way. I hope it will do the same for you. Thank you for watching and see you next time.